Welcome to the number one podcast covering Michigan State basketball. The Final Four is not in the schedule. Join Rod and me, Eric, as we dive deep into the Spartans to get you prepared for every game. Subscribe today for in-depth recruiting updates and fantastic interviews with today's important college basketball personalities like Robbie Hummel. Thanks for having me. I, uh, I have listened to your guys' podcasts numerous times on drives throughout any Midwestern Big Ten city, so I, I am big fans of your guys' work. Jay Billis. And next time, hey, if anybody in Michigan wants a December tea time, call me. You wimps won't show up, but I'll I'll be there. I'll be there and play in the cold, and Izzo will be in front of the fire with hot chocolate. Coaches Thomas Kelly. Oh, no problem. Glad to be back, man. Glad to be back. Mike Garland. Just can't sit there and trade twos for threes. You can't do it. You're gonna lose. Coming down the stretch, you're gonna lose. And more. You won't find better coverage of Spartan Hoops than you will get here. For both the casual and hardcore fan, come along as we take you for a green and white ride. Hey everybody, it's Eric alongside Rod, here to preview MSU's upcoming annual game against the Oakland Grizzlies. This is a game that Michigan State has played 20 years in a row, and is a perfect 20-0 which probably should make us nervous. Uh, Oakland, coached by a longtime Izzo friend, Greg Campy, whose team always comes ready to play. You know who else comes up ready to play? Us. Although a lot of what happens in this podcast is behind the scenes, i just like to give you an idea of what, we've been, what we do to bring you this content. We love doing the show. There's no question about that. But I've put this together while on the go in faraway continents and during our vacations over the last uh, few weeks. So if you appreciate the show, give us a little love back. And leave a written five-star review on the show uh, on your podcast player or Spotify. Please uh, please pause the show right now. Do that real quick so that other Spartan fans can find the show in the algorithm. Then restart it up and we'll talk in just a little bit here about Oakland. All right, Rod. Michigan State prepares to face yet another bear of an opponent. Last game was Baylor and this is Oakland. Oakland is 6-5 six and five this season coming into Breslin on Monday night. They've played their typical, really challenging non-conference schedule. They lost to Ohio State by six, Illinois by 11, both way games, obviously. But they did beat Xavier uh, on the road by two, and they're off to a one-on-one start in the horizon. As far as statistically, uh, Oakland has the 145th ranked offense and 160 ranked defense per Ken Palm. On offense, nothing is you know real great positive. They're shooting 32.9% from three. Better inside the arc, where they're number 106 from twos. They don't offense rebound a lot, number 218. And don't get to line very much, at number 315th in field uh, free throw attempts to field goal attempts. And are uh, middling 126th in turnover percentage. Defense, they've really had some problems. They're struggling to defending the twos at ranking at number 278. Uh, partly because they have one of the lowest block percentages in the country at 352. I mean, that's got to be pretty much the bottom, I would think, right? One of the 355 teams. Right right down there. Yep. <laughs> uh, so overall, they're also 106th in defensive rebounding, which is sort of the best thing they do on defense. They also play very slowly at 247th in overall pace and 300th in overall uh, offensive length of possession. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting their their statistical profile is a little bit worse than I would have expected given some of their results because you know, as you mentioned they beat Xavier on the road and this mm-hmm. is this yeah. isn't a vintage Xavier team this year but it's still that's a win over a Big East team and and they were competitive on the road against the two Big Ten teams so you look at that and you think well they got to be doing some things really well but honestly there's not much that sticks out as a big positive there have been oakland teams in the past where you know that was the case that there was something right they really leaned on you know it, it years ago greg campy had some teams that shot the three exceptionally well or they had they had a run for a while where they had some very, very strong individual scores. They had Kendrick Nunn, they had Khalil Felder, yep. you know, they had some of those kind of guys, you know, NBA caliber players. And this team really doesn't have any of those elements. They've been, you know, their their profiles are okay in most areas. They're not great. They're not, you know, fall off a cliff bad other than as you mentioned, the block percentage and and then kind of flowing from that, they really have struggled to defend against twos. 
And it's in large part, it's because they just don't have very much size. Um, yeah. As you go through the roster, they don't have that. But, you know, you mentioned MSU is perfect uh, over over the history <laughs> yeah. of this rivalry. Now, quite honestly, I think I think that in and again, it's due to myopia as many things are in life. Um, I think people tend to focus on the two or three times that Oakland has been really competitive and come close. I always think about that overtime game when they had Khalil yep. Felder. And MSU, I believe Denzel Valentine was hurt and not playing in that one. And Bryn Forbes ended up having a big game to help MSU pull it out. Um, that's one memorable one. But I think people focus on those handful of times where Oakland's been really competitive. The fact of the matter is, for the most part, these have been pretty easy wins for MSU historically. Yeah. That's that's the reality of it. And, and I think that's a credit to the way that Tom Izzo has approached this game. I was reading uh, an article this afternoon that had quotes from both Izzo and Campy about this rivalry. And one of the interesting things is that Izzo said, you know, even with talk about the Big Ten going to 22 conference games, he said he guaranteed that as long as he's at MSU and Campy's at Oakland, Oakland will be on the MSU schedule. The, the actual yeah. contract expires, I believe, after next year, but I would take that to the bank that that's going to get renewed. Um, but one of the things he's talked about is how, you know, he it's it's always been a game he's been able to get the attention of his team. You know, there years ago when I would talk about this game, I would I would say things like, you know, hey, MSU can't look past this one. You know, especially yeah. it's it's not as much the case now, although there's still a little bit of it. But years ago, and I'm talking like 10, 12 years ago, um, Campy had very Michigan centric rosters. And in particular, he had a lot of guys from mid Michigan. He had guys from schools like Okemos and DeWitt, Hazlitt. And, you know, I would worry about those guys who were good players in many instances really coming in jacked to play Michigan State, the school they probably rooted for when they were kids. Right. And, you know, it's like, oh, MSU can't look past these guys. Well, the fact is they rarely have. Usually Michigan State in this game historically does not come out and lay an egg. You know, they usually have played pretty well against Oakland, and I think that's a credit to the guys on the teams, and it's also obviously a credit to the coaching staff that they haven't allowed that to happen. They've taken it seriously, and they've played accordingly, uh, which is why we haven't seen a ton of really close calls. Um, you know, where this one stacks, look, we <laughs> Michigan State's working on a one-game streak of playing to their potential <laughs> you know yeah that's where they're at so as we talked about coming out of that one what's the challenge now build on that you did it once do it again and then do it again after that and so on um so this is a very quick turnaround only a couple days between the games um one day really and uh, yeah, right. and you you need to respond if you're Michigan State. You need to play up to your potential. You need to play with the same kind of ferocity that they showed against Baylor. If they do that, this is a win. If they don't do that, who knows what can happen? I mean, again, I, as I point out, Oakland's profile, as you go through it, isn't particularly impressive, but... They were competitive against both the Big Ten teams, and they beat Xavier. They're also two and yeah. one against Mac schools, you know. Um, and they smacked uh, Detroit Mercy around pretty good. Then they also got blown out against, I think it was Indiana, Purdue, Fort Wayne. So who knows what that means? But um, <laughs> you know, the, it's got it's got the potential to be a competitive game if Michigan State decides to let it. Yeah. It's always a tricky thing too, you know, with those, that two day turnaround in some ways you're like, well, 
this is really great. If you come off a really great big win, you can keep that momentum. Mm-hmm. You don't have time to really get out of that mode. The other thing is you can kind of sort of just be sit- sitting there reveling in your victory and sort of just like uh, kind of almost forget about this game. And so, you know, I guess whatever the outcome is, you'll think that it was in some way it was because of what happened in, on Saturday against Baylor when, you know, it may just be totally just random. Um, yeah, the uh, the one thing, the reason I think a lot of people get worried, I shouldn't say a lot of people, why a number of people get worried about this is Izzo always brings up the games that were close, right? He always talks about right. them and how Oakland almost beats them. And so he, he is as much responsible for that sort of attitude that Oakland's got Michigan State's number. They just haven't quite gotten over the edge uh, because I think he, and I think he's, it's partly respect for Campy, you know, that he's, it his is. team comes prepared to play. And I think he's, it's, it's like a nice thing to say and to he's him. Also, you know, and he's also, and he mentioned this in the article I read today. He's also conscious of the fact that Oakland, for every every year, you know, this is really the Super Bowl for Oakland. And you know that Greg Campy <laughs> wants to get at least one before he's done at Oakland. Yeah. You know, um, it means a lot to him. And I think it means a lot to him, not just because of what Michigan State is as a program, but also the relationship between he and Izzo. One of the other things that was pointed out in the article is can't be being very grateful to Izzo for continuing to play the series. Um, right. It mentioned how John Beeline flat out told him uh, this is this goes back to like 2010, 2011. Beeline flat out told Campy. I'm not going to play you anymore because I can't afford to lose to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and and consequently, they have not played Michigan very often. So yeah, um, I think it's a it's a obviously a big deal for Campy that Michigan State continues to do it, and you know that he desperately wants one before he retires, which I have no idea when that'll be. He doesn't seem to be slowing down. But, um, you know, that's why Izzo's conscious of it, I think, is that he knows how important the game is to them. And when you're in that, it's not a very comfortable position to be in, you know? Nobody really wants to be Goliath, you know? No, you'd ra- you don't gain much by winning, and you right. can, it's only only ri- r- risk. No, you'd, reward, rather, really. you'd rather be David. Now, now, again, I will say one thing, you know, this team does have some Michigan kids. They're not as Michigan-centric as they used to be. I mean, there used to be years where it seemed like every starter was a Michigan kid, and it's it's not quite that way anymore. They also seem to have far fewer mid-Michigan players than they used to. They went through a period where they really recruited mid-Michigan well, and that uh, they've got one guy in their rotation who's from Hazlitt, um, Lampaman. Um, but uh, I think that helps Michigan State a little bit because that was the element that I always worried about. When they had guys like, yeah. you know, Johnny Jones from uh, or, or Travis Bader from o- both from Okemos or I can't remember the name of the kid. They had a kid from DeWitt who was an exceptional shooter at one point. Um, you know, they had, a, they had a big man who played at Sexton with Denzel Valentine and Bryn Forbes. You know, they had these kind of guys. And that's what I personally always worried about was these guys who grew up watching Michigan State, likely rooting for Michigan State, weren't quite good enough to get a Michigan State offer. But boy, you give a player like that who can play. And some of these guys I mentioned were really good players at that level. You worry about it. You know, like yeah, with that, give them that platform, that, that just little bit of extra motivation, and they're already good, you know. But if, for whatever reason, Michigan State has always been able to deal with it. Well, before we start talking about the players, just want to mention too, if uh, for those of you who've listened to our Jay Billis interview, uh, if you haven't, go back and listen to it. It's, it was this summer, uh, but he mentioned going golfing with Greg Campy and Izzo. And I think, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that Izzo and, and Campy are pretty close as, as close as, you know, coaches can be uh, in this sort of environment. Uh, and last, and last time at the Breslin, you viewers may recall, listeners may recall that they wore ugly yeah. Christmas sweaters and 
<laughs> I think it's like the Grinch or something. And I that think it's said that that's else. never happening again. Yeah. That would, that would, that was, I don't think we'll see any antics like that. It would be awesome if it happened again, but I don't think, uh, I don't think it's going to do that again. But so anyway, let's, let's talk about the starters for, for Oakland. And this uh, segment is brought to you by one of great sponsors, the brothers at just two gutters. It is winter, but it's, well, it's raining out right now. So uh, rain is, and water problems are still an issue in the state of Michigan. So if you have issues with your gutters or think you might, or wonder if you do, have the gutters or the brothers adjust your gutters, come out, check things out. They can clean out your gutters. If you've got leaves and junk in there, they can put leaf guards on, they can repair your gutters. They can even replace them if you need to. It doesn't have to be your home. It can also be your commercial. Uh, it can be your you know, place of business. They will come out and do it right away. They're very efficient. They're fully insured. They get the job done and they, they get great pricing. Uh, just, you know, it's a great experience. Uh, you can contact Kurt on the southeast side of the state, the Metro Detroit area. He's got a very large region there. Or you can get a hold of uh, of Kurt over on the Grand Rapids, the West Michigan side. Uh, they'll set you up. You can find our contact information below on your podcast player or at the website at tffinots.com and just look in the underneath for the episode description. You can also just go to brothersgutters.com and type in your location and can get a hold of them that way. 10% off if you mention Final Four for your estimate. All right, so, and that segment is going to be, as of, of course, is the player that Michigan State needs to keep in the gutter, which Ronald will point out in a little bit, although it's pretty obvious with this uh, these starters yeah. here. So begin with Rocket Watts, our friend from Michigan State who transferred to Oakland a couple years ago. This is his second time playing here uh, at the Breslin. He's averaging eight and a half points a game this season on 41, 25, and 71 shooting. Uh, has tw- 21 assists and 21 turnovers. I, you know, it, from a number standpoint, just looking at that, it seems like the same Rocket who left Michigan State yeah. uh, back as a, after a sophomore year. Yeah, you know, it, it, he he actually didn't transfer to Oakland. He transferred to Mississippi State, did a year there. Oh, right, And right. then yeah, last yeah, year right. went to Oakland and, and is now playing his COVID year. It's a, it's really hard to believe right. that, you know, it's part of that effect that I think a lot of people notice of the pandemic just kind of distorting time that we're talking about <laughs> Rocket Watts in his fifth year of playing college basketball because it does seem like yesterday that he was a freshman playing with Cassius mm-hmm. Winston. Um, <laughs> yeah. A, a long time ago, actually. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it just... And and I don't know whether it's strictly health or, you know, it's it's probably a combination of things. But he just hasn't ever managed to get fully back to where he was, say, the last half of his freshman year at Michigan State. Because that year, he was uh, just a tremendous defensive player. He did a decent mm-hmm. job as a secondary ball handler, and his shot really got dialed in. And it's never happened again that way for him. You know, you look at those numbers, and, you know, to sub 30% from three, I can tell you, having seen a, a lot of Rocket Watts play bas- playing basketball, if he can't shoot better than that, it, it makes life tough for him because he's he's a good, not great penetrator. And so if teams can play off him, it makes life even harder in that area of the game. You know, and I think I think you probably do. If Rocket wants to take a three, you're comfortable with that as an opponent. You know? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean it yeah, it's it, it is interesting. It it's not that long ago that he was going to be the starting point guard and was, and yeah. just did not. I mean, Cause he was, uh, well, he was the, that's when, um, AJ was a freshman, right. I think. Right. And right. Rocket, and the, Rocket the was plan, the plan that was the rocket was going to be the starter and you had foster lawyer in there to help him. And the thought was, Hey, AJ's probably not going to play. And it went so badly with rocket and, and with foster that they had to press A.J. into playing a significant role in the back half of that season far sooner than I think anybody had anticipated. And, and you know, that you could play the what-if games from now till infinity, but 
<laughs> I, I one thing that got mentioned at the time, and I think has some currency, is I think Rocket got dealt a really, really bad hand by COVID because he did not have the opportunity to do much work at all with the coaching staff during that off season. And when you were talking about moving to a position as complicated and difficult as point guard running Tom Izzo's team, that's a huge negative. And I think it was, I'll admit it was, I undervalued the significance of it. And I think a lot of people did. I think a lot of people were like yeah. me, where you looked at the way he played in the back half of that freshman season and thought, okay, he isn't going to be Cassius, but he's good enough. He's shown enough to suggest that he can handle this. They're going to, they're going to play differently. And you know, what I envisioned was something more along the lines of what they got from guys like Kalen Lucas or Keith Appling, who weren't necessarily pure point guards either, but they were guys who were scorers who were still good enough to run the offense. That's what I had expected to happen, and it just didn't work. And, you know, from there, obviously, he transferred out. He had a pretty indifferent year at Mississippi State, and then he played last year and this year at Oakland. And, you know, he's starting. I'm glad to see he's getting that opportunity, and he's certainly contributing for them. But it's fair to say, you know, we're talking about a guy who was a top 50 recruit coming out of high school. He has, other than maybe about a 15-game stretch his freshman year, he's never really sniffed the level of expectation that you would have had for him. Yeah. I think I well, also, also think some to, of that is health too, by the way. Oh, I think so too. Yeah. And, and it also goes to the point where I think it's a little unfair. Sometimes people point out uh, recruiting rankings and, you know, this guy's a bust, this guy was, you know, when sometimes, you know, they're just guesses and many, they're educated guesses, but they're just guesses, you know, how someone's actually going to develop and, 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 you know, progress over the next three to four or five years or whatever yeah. they're playing. Uh, so move on to your next starter, Jack Gulke. 6'3 grad transfer from Hillsdale, who we should say faced an exhibition earlier this season. He's averaging 12.3 points a game on 33, 32, and 92 shooting, uh, averaging four and a half rebounds a game and is playing 36 minutes a game. Yeah, heavy, heavy minutes. I mean, 36 minutes is <laughs> a lot. Um, and, you know, it's you would say it's been pretty successful to have a guy transfer up from D2. And we talked about it when MSU played that exhibition game, you know, Hillsdale has had a very successful program at that level in recent years. So I guess it's not a total shocker that one of their guys could step up to the Horizon League level and be pretty good. Um, and so he's been a key. I mean, anybody playing 36 minutes a night is a key guy. So <laughs> goes without saying. Yep. The next would be Isaiah Jones, 6'7 sophomore, averaging 6.9 points a game and 5.4 rebounds a game, shooting 62 36 and 62, although it's not a whole lot of threes. Yeah, he's mostly an inside the arc player, but a guy who, as a freshman, played a fair amount. I think he played in like 24 games, um, but wasn't getting heavy minutes. And now he's become a starter. So he's definitely stepped up in class, but they certainly like some of the things he's been able to do. Um, you know, and then as a sophomore, uh, I would think they, they believe he's got potential to be even better down the line. Trey Townsend would be next, 6'6", 230-pound junior. I felt like there were rumors of him even possibly transferring to Michigan State. And then, of course, you know, Lee Cole elected to come back. And I feel like that sort of um, sort of torpedoed that I thought that he might transfer, uh, or at least he was looking to, to leave. He's obviously stayed at Oakland. He's averaging 15.8 points a game and 7.5 rebounds a game leading the team, shooting 45, 44, and 78, although, again, he's not a huge volume deep shooter. Uh, he leads the team with 39 assists, but also has 34 turnovers and uh, is obviously the guy who kind of gets their offense running. They run everything through him. He's definitely the guy to keep in the gutter in this one. There's, <laughs> yeah, there's right. not really a competition for that. Um, with the transfer thing, I don't think that's quite accurate. Um, I, I think I think his name was mentioned, 
by Michigan State fans is, well, maybe that's somebody who could step in. Yeah, maybe that's what I'm thinking. But, of. Yeah. you know, his father, if I remember correctly, played at Oakland. So he's a legacy. And mm-hmm. Oakland has had some issues, as many schools at that level have had, with guys transferring out. Um, but maybe not as many as you might have thought. Um, Greg Campy has actually been able to keep guys, even in the grad transfer period. There were a couple of indications. I remember I mentioned a few minutes ago Travis Bader, who was a kid from Okemos, was a, a 6'5 guard who was an exceptional three-point shooter. And I remember zeroing in on him as, hey, this is a guy – that Michigan State, and I forget the exact year it was, but it was a year where it felt like to me they could really use one more shooter. And I just thought, mm-hmm. hey, this is this is perfect to see this kind of addition. And he didn't leave. He stuck it out and played his, his grad year at Oakland. And so Campy's been able to do that. Trey Townsend is another example of um, his ability, and he's been more successful than most, I think, at keeping these guys around. And in fact, he's had success going the other way. He's had a number of players um, transfer to Oakland from major programs where for whatever reason it wasn't working out and finish their careers at Oakland. He, He went through a period of time, less so in recent years, ironically, but He went through a period of time where he had a lot of guys like that who had started out um, at other places. Some some of them were local kids who had gone to other schools. It didn't work out, and then they decided to to come home more or less. Um, And I mentioned Kendrick Nunn. Kendrick Nunn was a guy who started at Illinois and got into some trouble there and needed a place to land, ended up at Oakland. and was sensational in the one year he had at Oakland and then has, has had some time in the NBA. So, uh, but yeah, I don't think there was ever a real possibility of Trey Townsend going anywhere from what I understand. Yeah, finally, Chris Conway, 6'9", 220-pound junior, averaging 10.5 points a game, 3.5 rebounds a game, shooting 55% from the floor and 77% from the line. Yeah, I mean, he's a center really nominally because he's six nine but if you look at those rebounding numbers are not huge he's not a shot blocker he has shot the ball well he's given them some scoring punch but um he's not really you know physically he's not going to be much of a match for what michigan state rolls out moving to the reserves uh the aforementioned blake lampman six three fifth year senior from uh hazlitt he's a uh, was recently injured, but he's now back. He's averaging 9.3 points a game on 37, 37, and 50 shooting. And about uh, 80% of those shots are from behind the line. So, yeah, and then uh, obviously he's, he gets damaged. Done that's deep. where he's going to have an impact, you know, and he's a guy that they really need to get back in the flow of things because, as we mentioned, you know, 32.9% as a team from three is not great. Um, and and he's arguably their most well, certainly their their biggest volume three point shooter, and you could make an argument that he's their best shooter. I mean, Townsend has statistically shot it very well, but as we mentioned, he doesn't take a ton of them. So right, um, they really need Lampman to get back in the swing of things and and give them a consistent presence from three. Next would be DQ Cole, 6'3", junior transfer from Henry Ford Community College, averaging 6.9 points a game on 46, 35, and 57 shooting. Yeah, a local kid from Pontiac, played at Henry Ford CC. Um, now he's at Oakland. He's done a decent job for them uh, as, a, as a reserve guard, and he'll continue to see those minutes. You know, the, the biggest problem Oakland's got, in my mind, offensively, is they just don't have any semblance of a real point guard. I mean, Trey Townsend is their top assist guy, you know, and he's a power (laughs) forward. That tells the story. And they just, none of these guys they've got at the guard spots um, 
really seem to be that kind of player. And that's that's a rarity for Greg Campy teams. Greg Campy has had, and I'm I'm drawing a blank on the kid's name. He's had for the last several years. He had a kid from uh, the Chicago area who was a multi-year starter and a very good player for them at the point. And then, you know, in years before that, he always had guys like Khalil Felder or Johnny Jones. You know, they've had very strong point guard play usually. So it's a rarity to see a team like this where they just don't have anybody who's kind of stepped forward and been a floor leader for them. Next would be Tuburu Naivalarua, 6'6 Juco transfer, averaging 4.8 points a game, three rebounds a game in about 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, 62% from the floor, 40% from the line. Yeah, the free throw shooting's rough. Uh, (laughs) Juco transfer, not a huge guy, but on this team, he's what passes for um, (laughs) interior depth, you know. Osei Price, 6'4", junior wing, averaging a little under a point a game, shooting 60, 67, and 50, and obviously limited volume. Right, and he's played sparingly. He's shot well a few times. He's actually managed to take shots, but, um, <laughs> yeah, not not a heavy contributor thus far. And finally, Andre Polk, 6'9", native of Detroit, transferred from CMU, averaging 0.7 points a game and 0.7 rebounds a game in four minutes. I'm surprised he hasn't made a bigger impact. You know, I saw him play in high school in AAU with the family. And although he was raw, he had, you know, he had size, obviously. He had a little bit of athletic ability. And he wasn't half bad at Central. So I'm a little bit surprised that he hasn't been able to do more for Oakland because God knows they could use an interior presence. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll f- find out more why, when we watch him play if he yeah. comes in and plays a few minutes. All right. So then we'll move on to the five keys of the game brought to you by Nudge Printing. Nudge Printing it should be your go to spot to go f- get Spartan apparel or the collegiate apparel. They've got all the vintage Spartan logos, they've got unique Spartan uh, t shirts, hoodies, sweatshirts, the stuff to make all your friends jealous. Great stuff to just toss on, head to the bar, and watch the Spartans play. You can find all their stuff at nudgeprinting.com. They have a huge collection, not only Michigan State stuff, but other colleges in the state of Michigan and and beyond. So check out their stuff at nudgeprinting.com. Listeners of the show get 20% off if they type in Final Four, that's just one word, at checkout. And obviously a little bit late to get stuff for Christmas, but it's never too late to get your nudge printing stuff. It's always a popular uh, apparel for my family, everyone's favorite. So check it out at nudgeprinting.com. So five keys to the game. Number one, sustain. So Michigan State, you know, obviously came off a fantastic performance in energy and physicality and defense. Can they keep that going more than just one game? That's the the biggest thing that I'm going to pay attention to in this one is the intensity in terms of effort, in terms of physicality and focus. Because the defensive focus in that Baylor game was really high level. And, I mean, Michigan State was connected defensively in a way we haven't seen this season. Even even when they've had games that they played reasonably well defensively, it wasn't like that. So that's the biggest thing. This team is not good enough, in my view, to go out and, and just simply out-talent people. They've yeah. got talent. I mean, make no mistake about that, obviously. But they can't, they're, they're just not that kind of team. For them to get anywhere close to where their ceiling is, it's got to come via what we're talking about here. Uh, the defensive end, first yeah. and foremost, and then playing with the kind of effort, toughness, and focus that's going to allow everything else to flow from that. Yeah, they're not like some old Kentucky or North Carolina team, Duke team that just overwhelms yeah. you with just everything on the floor, right? They have to be connected and, or that, and play or that can, a good collective game. Or that can kind of play disinterestedly in some ways, but they've just got so much offensive skill that they'll make enough plays at that end despite it all to win. That we, We've seen what that looks like with this team. They don't have that. 
And the one fortunate thing for Michigan State is coming off that Baylor game, you ordinarily, if you looked at this schedule beforehand, you might be a little concerned thinking they might be a little tired because a lot of minutes have to be played by the starters in a game against Baylor. But there was a lot of rest because, you know, it's a fairly easy victory uh, for the team. So that shouldn't be as much a problem as it might have been, I think, going into uh, just a quick turnaround. And that kind of going along with that, that, you know, Izzo has to date at least stuck with the idea of a large playing group. So you have, you don't have anybody going out there playing 36 minutes, you know? Yeah. I think, well, I think Tyson played 31 in that game against Baylor. And he's the, right. And he's easily the highest. And he's also probably their, in my opinion, at least he's probably their best conditioned guy. So he's, he's a guy you don't worry about in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. You certainly don't worry about the guys who aren't banging around as much, right? Like the, the, you know, guards out on on the backcourt. So number two key to the game, the four spot. So you already mentioned that, you know, Townsend is the guy who stirs the drink for Oakland. He's the guy they need to keep in the gutter. And that's going to be on Malik Hall to try and keep him controlled for portions when he's out there playing. Yeah. And physically, this is a, this is a good matchup because they're, they're somewhat similar guys. Um, Malik's a, probably an inch or so taller, but there are some similarities in terms of the way they're built or the way they can play. Um, Townsend's been more reliable from deep this year, but um, you know the way Malik shot historically, there's a lot of similarities. So it, it's an intriguing matchup. Um, the ideal thing for Michigan State would be if if they can find a way to get Townsend in some early foul trouble. Um, if right. you take him away from this team, I think it gets very grim for Oakland offensively. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, and Malik is certainly a guy who has shown at times this year, you look at the Nebraska game, for example, you know, there are times he can get rolling and you post him up and let him operate inside. There's the possibility that you could you could put Townsend in some positions he doesn't want to be in and, and maybe for some foul trouble. But it should be a good matchup yeah, regardless. Absolutely. Yeah, it's almost interesting now. I feel like at this point, uh, you know, when we coming into the season, we had assumed that as far as backup minutes of the four, it was going to probably be Booker. And pretty clearly at this point, it's, I mean, obviously it's Carr. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, Booker, if is he more, is he just going to be more of like a five reserve at you this know, point, do you think? Because it's almost like the four is a little more complicated for him to try and learn. It's just more to learn, I think, you know, from a defensive standpoint than at the five. If you, you know, Booker gave an interview um, last week. And if you listen to what he was saying, it sure sounded that way. Yeah. Now, you know, one thing that also makes you wonder is, boy, assuming Jackson Kohler does come back, which, you know, seeing that boot, I'm not ready to declare anything as a done deal yet. We'll see. But assuming that he does come back, um, they might be very serious about him playing the four, which would then mean that there is that would lend credence to the idea that they're they're really focusing on book being a five. Um, so I think you make a good point. It it seems that way for right now, um, and uh, I think you're probably also correct in surmising that. It might be in large part dictated by defense. So moving on to the third point in the game, uh, sorry, third, third key to the game is paint points. So Michigan State, uh, I think, outscored Baylor like 42-28, I think. Uh, yeah. So, you know, that's where they got, that's where they really got going, even though we always pay attention to the threes. Uh, the twos are worth not as much, but they're certainly uh, easier to get oftentimes, especially when you're dunking it <laughs> like they were against Baylor. Well, and, and it's... It's always a key. I don't know if people remember um, when Michigan State went on that run in the COVID year and beat those top 10 teams and fought their way into the tournament. um, A big, 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 big part of that was that they finally figured out how to get production in the paint. And a lot of it came via Aaron Henry. I was going to say Aaron Henry, yeah. Yep. Um, 
this team has similar challenges to that one. That one also lacked a really reliable low post score. Marcus Bingham gave them a little tiny bit of that, but not much. No. And and that team had to also figure out well, how do we manufacture production inside? And it 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 came that they didn't have one advantage this current team has over that one is this current team has much more in terms of its backcourt players having the ability to beat people off the dribble and get themselves into the lane. That team kind of had to manufacture it with Aaron Henry just sort of working his way into the lane and scoring inside. And it, it they got enough of it in the end. Um, but it's it's massively important, you know, if if you want to have optimal offense, in my view, you you need balance. If you can't score inside, then opponents have very little reason to not try to lock you down on the perimeter, which means your spacing's probably not going to be as good. Your shot windows are going to be shorter. It just makes it tougher to get production. So it's all interrelated. If you want better three-point shooting, you need more interior production. Well, this Michigan State team doesn't really have pure post-up threats right now. You know, Malik Hall can give you that some to some extent. Um, mm -hmm. A.J. Hogard maybe can get you a post-up or two, but by and large, that's not how you're going to get it done. So how do you get it done? Well, one of the ways you do it is what we saw a little bit in the Baylor game. MSU really took advantage of what I gather may be something of a weakness for that Baylor team in terms of the way they handle pick and roll stuff, that they're not particularly good at staying connected to uh, the role man. And Michigan State was able to get it a couple times with Carson Cooper, for example, on yeah. lobs. Uh, so that's one way you can do it. But that's not a huge part of what Michigan State's offense has been. The The real key is get the guards into the lane. Then that's primarily going to be Tyson Walker and A.J. Hogard. And particularly A.J. is the guy I'm always watching because, um, you know, as he goes, Michigan State tends to go. Oakland has been very weak in defending twos. They have no shot blocking presence to speak of, and teams have had a lot of success against them inside the arc. So it would stand to reason that there's an opportunity for Michigan State to do a lot of damage there. But that's how it's got to happen. And if it does happen, and you see Michigan State doing that successfully, I guarantee you the quality, you can't guarantee that they make threes, but the quality of the looks they're going to get is going to continue to improve as a result. Right. So the fourth key to the game, the pace. So Michigan State had a pretty good pace last game against Baylor. Well, everything would look pretty much good against Baylor, but a lot of transition because off of defense, the 15 steals certainly helped. And Oakland generally likes to play a little slow this year. So, uh, you know, the pace would probably help Michigan State. Well, look, it it's it was starting to get a lot of discussion heading into the Baylor game, and I think rightly so. I think it's something we've talked about. This Michigan State team, in my opinion, needs to play fast. They are not built, you know, last year they got to be pretty good at playing slower half-court basketball, but you know, Joey Hauser gave them some elements they don't have right now. Right. And and then and I also think, you know, you've got guys who were very, very good shooters last year operating in the half court who have not been nearly as good this season. So you you have to play the cards you're dealt. And to me, it's no accident that the best they've looked happen to coincide with a game where they ran the ball, they were able to get into transition, and they got a lot done that way. Um, you know, it, Oakland's not going to want to let that happen. 
they're gonna they're gonna do what they can to prevent that, right? But yeah. it's incumbent upon Michigan State to do what they can to push it. And what was disconcerting before the Baylor game is it felt to me as if, particularly AJ, wasn't really looking to push anymore. He was just kind of accepting it and settling. Can't have that. Um, it goes along with the quality of defense you're playing, with the way you're rebounding defensively. It's all right. of those things. And if you can get some of those steals, the way we saw against Baylor, well, that helps too. But it's also just about having the intent 100% of the time, looking up constantly, constantly looking to push the push the issue, force the action. And if they get back, okay, so be it. Then you're into your offense quicker in the half court. You know, if that's the worst thing that happens, so be it. And the fifth and final key, confident shooting. We should say it's definitely been shooting better the last couple of games and 63% last game. We don't expect that many times this season, but uh, certainly they're looking better. And that's, again, reflection is sort of what you're just talking about as well. The, I believe the Nebraska and Baylor games combined, they're 16 for 29 from three. So better than, you know, significantly better than 50% over those two games. That's a big deal, right? Yeah. Um, there's a confidence that comes with success. I mean, that's that sounds like a very obvious statement, but it's true. <laughs> you see the ball start going through the hoop and you start to feel better about yourself. You know, Tyson Walker, who's had a very, very good offensive season in many ways, but he hadn't been shooting the three well until, I forget what his numbers were against Nebraska, but they were decent. And then he went I think four, he's three of eight. Okay. So solid. And then, so over those two games, that's, that's seven for 12 because he was four yeah, for good. four against Baylor. And he's up to 39% on the year, you know? That's knocking on the door of being exactly where you would have expected him to be, which was somewhere north of 40. Um, so I think he's feeling very, very confident in his shot. Uh, Jay Nakins has gotten his way up to 30%. Not great, but it's significantly better than it was even a couple weeks ago. I think he's maybe starting to feel a level of confidence with his shot. Um, Trey Holloman has shot it well all year long. So you've got all of those guys, I think, because they're having success, feeling confident, and that will likely breed more good results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The next step is the guys like Malik Hall and A.J. Hogard, who have continued to struggle. You'd like to see them start finding a little bit of success, seeing some shots go through the, through the hoop. And it can, just as much as it felt like early this year, it was just a snowball effect where <laughs> yeah. everybody was struggling and it just, you could just feel the lack of confidence coming from everybody team-wide, other than Trey Hollow. Um, we may be on the verge of seeing the flip side of that because you you've got three guys that it feels like are feeling pretty good right now. You get a couple more into that mix, and I'm not even talking about, you know, a guy like Jeremy Fierce, let's say, who struggled with his deep shot the few times he's taken it. Um, but get those other, get whole guard, get Hall going, then you might really be cooking with something. All right. Uh, the only other thing I'd like to add, and I posted this in the Spartan Meg board, I am going to apologize to all the listeners. So occasionally I will write uh, the post-game analysis, the, the write-up before the game is even played, just so it gives me a little bit of head start and getting stuff in. And I realized looking back that I've done this four times this season, and I had written on with both the James Madison, Wisconsin, Nebraska, a write-up that pretty much just says Michigan State wins, the score was X to X. Uh, and those were all, <laughs> of course, losses. And the one time... I had written down that Michigan State lost was the Baylor game, which they ended up winning. So I will promise to not write any more uh, any more write ups ahead of the games unless I write that Michigan State has lost the game. So I promise that. So, all right. So uh, make sure you check out the our greatest sponsors of the game, uh, 
the show, Nudge Printing at nudgeprinting.com. Also, the Brothers of Just Two Gutters, you can find all the contact information below. And we'll be back very soon with the post-game analysis of Oakland. So until next time, the final four is on the schedule. Go Green.